So now that we've explored Cox proportional hazards model a little bit, we're going to talk about what the assumptions of the model are, and I'm going to give a brief mention of a little bit about how we can check them, just in name now, and then we'll get into the details of, of checking them a little bit later. So the first assumption is that there's non-informative sensory. So that an observation being censored that is not related to the likelihood of the event occurring. So in other words, if someone sense was censored, it doesn't mean they were more likely to die or less likely to die. Can we assume that it's random or non-informative? Second assumption is that the survival times, little t, these are independent. And this assumption of um, independent observations, we're making that assumption as we've seen throughout the course in pretty much um, every regression model that we've been working with. That person one survival time does not depend on person two, person three, and so on. One important point for these here, these two assumptions, I just want to point out that all models assume these. Okay, and what I mean by that is we've talked about the Kaplan-Meier survival model as well as the exponential survival or the Weibull model. Um, so those as well all make these assumptions. So these are not unique to cost proportional hazard model. The third assumption is that hazards are proportional. Or we said another way we can think of it is that the hazard ratio is constant over time. Maybe I should mention now some ways we can check that, and we'll look at the details of some of these later. But just to give the mention now, is we can check proportional hazards using something called a C log log plot. We can also check them using um, Schoenfeld's test. And I'm sure that there's some others that I'm not aware of in name right now. But those are two of the ways we'll look at checking uh, the proportional hazards assumption. A fourth assumption, and this is one you know, should be used to with uh, generalized linear models, which has been what we've been looking at throughout the course. We start with linear models and then generalized linear models with the linearity assumption. So we're assuming that the log hazard is a linear function. of the x variables. And again, I read here, the numeric ones. Right, so we really only need to worry about the linearity assumption for numeric x's. If we're looking at a categorical x, like biological sex, male, female, um, we don't need to worry about linearity for those. This we can check in a very similar way that we check linearity for linear regression as well as Poisson regression. We can look at residual plots. And the residuals for um, survival analysis are a little bit different than they were in linear regression, but conceptually it's the same idea. If we look at a plot of residuals and we're looking for no pattern or a flat line around zero. And then an important point about assumption number three and four, that these assumptions, while they're made in cost proportional hazard model, they're also assumed so these assumptions are also made for the exponential as well as the y, which is the accelerated failure time model we looked at. So I thought it was important to mention that, especially uh, for this one, because cost proportional hazards model, the proportional hazard gets put in the, the name of the model. Although the exponential model also assumes proportional hazards. Right? So it assumes that the effect of x variables um, do not change over time. Then just a couple more assumptions. And again, well, let me, let me say it first. One is that the values of x don't change over time. So when we were working with, say, linear regression, we didn't need to worry about this assumption because we didn't have a time component to our data. 
Here, as we're following people over time, we need to make the assumption that their value of x does not change as time goes by. So, suppose if the variable x is arguing on treatment A versus treatment B, that people aren't changing from one treatment to the other over time. Or, you know, if x is dosage of the drug, that the dosage is constant, it's not changing over time. And then, the sixth one, I'm going to write it down. I don't know if this should be called an assumption or just a, a fact about Cox proportional hazard model, but either way, it's worth mentioning it here. So I'm going to put it here that the baseline hazard, right, that H naught of T, so the hazard for the reference group that's allowed to fluctuate over time, is unspecified. And again, we mentioned this in the previous video, right, that we don't actually need to estimate how the hazard changes over time, we can still estimate all the model coefficients. And that was a really big innovation of, of Cox and Cox proportional hazard model. Um, so let me just quickly again mention in name some of the solutions if some of these assumptions are uh, violated. And we'll look at implementing, implementing some of them um, as we progress. So if hazards are not proportional over time, or if the hazard ratio is not constant, One of the solutions is to stratify on the variable. Um, and we're going to expand on this later, so I'm just going to say it short for now. But if some, well, that example we talked about previously, if the hazard ratio for males versus females was not constant over time, it was changing over time, we could stratify on biological sex. Fit a model for males, fit a separate model for females. Um, so that's similar to what we did um, when looking at previous regression models. Right? If there was interaction or effect modification, we saw one option was to stratify, right? fit separate models in each strata. Or another solution is time-dependent coefficients or parameters. Right? Again, those are the Bs, right? or the betas, the model coefficients. So allow the model coefficients to change over time. And as we saw um, in that last video, this essentially is going to involve fitting an interaction term, right? allowing the effect of x to change depending on time. So those get called time-dependent coefficients or time-dependent parameter models. Um, and essentially it's the idea we've already captured. Include an interaction with that. Um, if the relationship between the log hazard and the numeric axis is not linear, the solutions are going to say the same as before. So throughout the course, we've already talked a lot about addressing nonlinearities, so I won't get into the details of them, but I'll just quickly mention we can try transformations. So we can try working with the log of x, square root of x, or other transformations that we've encountered. We can include polynomials, so x and x squared, or x, x squared, and x cubed. We can try categorizing x, so taking that numeric variable and creating categories. So all the same solutions we saw before, we um, can check them the same way, we implement them in the same way. Um, now, if the values of x are changing over time, so let's just suppose that x is the dosage of the drug, and that's actually changing over time, we can um, incorporate that into a model. We won't, we won't get into the details of this model in this course, I'm just going to mention the name, but it's time-dependent covariance. Remember, covariance is another um, name for X variables, right? or other X variables that get put in the model. So time-dependent covariance model. And again, this is an extension of the model we're seeing that's going to allow um, the values of X to change over time and build that in. And then the sixth one, um, it's not uh, really an assumption, as we said, it's more of a um, statement. But I guess I skipped over one and two. Non-informative censoring. Uh, if that assumption is violated, there's nothing we can really do about it. It's an important one to be met. The way we can try to check that 
is we can say take the censored observations, the non-censored observations, split them into two groups, and try and compare the two of them on the values of the other x variables and see if they seem to be differing in any way. So there's that. There's also knowledge of study design that's going to help us decide if that's met. Same with survival times being independent. Um, this is more of a, a study design type question. So what we're going to do next is get into talking in a bit more detail. How can we check some of these assumptions? And if they're not met, um, how can we address those? So filling in a little bit more of the details I put here. And I should mention, again, we're going to be doing more of a kind of larger overview or survey of these ideas. And it's left to you to really dig into them more deeply if you want to explore these and learn about them on your own. Stick around, guys. There's more to see, and please stay safe.